First of all, um, it is an absolute honor to meet you. I can't really express to you the level of inspirations from an artistic perspective that you've bestowed upon me as a fellow admirer of your work. So this, this for me is a great honor and thank you so much for doing this, Nick. You're welcome. So, so Nick, I, uh, we can just jump right into it. Um, I, like I said, um, you know, obviously the, you know, once I found out who you were and I did more research into your career, I saw that your career, um, is a very extensive one yeah, starting in the seventies, you know, you were doing this stuff, you know, uh, in the late seventies up until today, long before you had this incredible breakthrough moment where I believe that you redefined what star Wars, you know, was to be perfectly honest, you know, um, the original trilogy was magnificent from this kind of uh, inspirational story perspective, but the prequels, gave Star Wars its, for me, its soul. And its soul emanated out of this little blade, um, you know, with the lightsaber became the most iconic weapon in the history of entertainment. And you gave that weapon its life. And we'll get into that. But before that, I want to chat a little bit about how you got started in all of this stuff. Like what kind of led a young Nick to say, hey, I'm going to risk my life for the entertainment of others. Um, well, I've spoken about it before. I was I was brought up in a in a rough old council estate in Brighton, where I, where I still live now, um, like the projects. <laughs> and, uh, uh, there were, one day I, I was sent to military school, but I wasn't going to do that. And one day there was a circus in the car park of the station in Brighton, and I wandered in there as a young lad and. Uh, got myself a job and never went home and so so I was in the circus from 12 till 18 and um over here to be in stunts you you have to qualify you have to there's a stunt register and so I trained for that and became a, a stunt performer at 18. And what what is when, when you became a stunt performer at 18, meaning that you would get hired to work on a television show or a film? Um... Yeah, it's uh, as I say here, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing here. It's very organized stunt. So you, you kind of do an apprenticeship. Mm. And you have to be an instructor in six sports initially just to get an instructor, near enough instructor mm. in six sports. And... Um, and and that's it. Then you get on and then you apprentice under stunt coordinators for the next five to ten years who teach you how to do it. And um, and then you become a stunt coordinator yourself or if you want to. But yes, yeah, so uh, I was lucky I apprenticed under mostly under Vic Armstrong, who mm. is a, a legendary stunt coordinator. And um yeah, worked on worked for. He did all the Indiana Jones movies, so he was with Lucasfilm. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. So that was kind of like your introduction, because I believe um, the first Lucasfilm project that you worked on was Willow. Um, I guess I don't know the timeline of it, Mark, but um, yeah, I, I worked from a, a lot, and not just them uh, directing, but them producing or writing. Right. And and um, you, you also got to work, and I don't know how extensive this is because, you know, um, keeping track of a stunt coordinator or a stunt man's career is not as well documented as some of the other, you know, disciplines in the film industry. But you also uh, worked uh, with Ridley Scott and Tom Cruise in uh, in Legend, correct? Legend, yeah. I think, yeah, that was my second... Third job, legend. I doubled Tom. Tom wasn't quite famous then. I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think risky business had come out. And um, he didn't have a driver. I know that because I used to go and pick him up. I had a crappy old car and I'd <laughs> go and pick him up. And he, he certainly didn't have a stylist because he was wearing awful clothes. He was he was like into heavy metal. He used to wear <laughs> jean jacket with the sleeves cut off and most of it was a good look now. But back then it was not so great. Right. And you um, did you double as uh, as Tom's? Uh, uh, you were Tom's stunt double throughout the filming well, of Legend. I was Tom's stunt double for Legend and for 
um, Interview with a Vampire and oh, wow. Far, and, Far and Away oh, and wow. uh, the other one. And, and the, what 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 was that like as being this you know young man working with like a young version of Tom Cruise and a young version of of you know the great Ridley Scott because I know you also got to work on Aliens which is uh, you know with James Cameron but that was after Ridley had already done Alien Part One so he was already starting to become this like big name director um, and, and like did you take into that world very easily or was there like a little bit of a learning curve? Um, I did because coming from the circus, the film business is easy. You know, I mean, the circus, you're doing those kind of things live mm. uh, in front of a massive audience. So, you, you know, you have to get it right. And so it was very easy. I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I, I surely don't. But And also, as I said, you apprentice, so you get taught. And I, and I was with such a good stunt coordinator. Mm. But, um no, I took to it like a duck to water. It was very similar <laughs> to what I'd come out of. And, and yeah, and you, you say about Ridley, I, I did a few films with him. I, I did uh, 1492 as well with him and Aliens. But Blade Runner is my number one, two, and three favorite film of all time. Oh, wow. Okay, beautiful. Um, you you mentioned earlier that you had um, to get into an apprenticeship in this industry. You had to have training in 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 as an instructor in specific disciplines. Which disciplines did you sort of focus in on growing up and and have um, the uh, the instructor level qualifications in? Well, you have there. There's a massive amount you can pick from, and you can have your own interests in them. You have to have a fighting one. So you know, I I had a kendo one. Mm. I also had done a lot of foil and epee. Uh, you have to have gymnastics. You have to have a swimming one. You have to have. When I did it, you had to have like cat ten parachuting. You have to have uh, oh, wow. a horsey diving underwater. It's so that you don't get hurt. You know, it's, I don't mean that it sounds, but in America, you can, if you're a member of SAG, you can be a stunt person. And the next day you can do a hundred foot fall. Right. And, you know, and you can get hurt. Sure. Whereas it's very different here. It's, um, we, we all like to get home at the end of the day. And when, when you worked on Willow um, or, you know, the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade films, um, did you start to develop a relationship with George Lucas at this point, or was it still pretty like distance between you and George? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I didn't know him. I didn't know him until Star Wars. I mean, I've seen him around, you know, um, but I didn't. I didn't meet him until Phantom. And and you know, just to kind of get into um, that a little bit, like because. You know, for me, the and I've heard George give a few interviews about it that like the the original trilogy, the sword fighting wasn't really, you know, a super deep focus in the filmmaking process, even though you know there's some decent fights in that. But when he wanted to make the prequels, he, he wanted to 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 show this martial art of being a Jedi at its at its fullest extent. And that is such a huge pressure on that film and I, I, I'm fascinated to know how he decided to entrust you with that incredible task. Um, well, he does, he's never been in a fight, George, <laughs> not, not ever in his life. He told me. Right. And, um, yeah, he wanted, I went in to see him. He wanted something. He didn't know what he wanted, but he wanted something very new and, mm. um, I was always interested in no rules, right? Mm -hmm. When you learn things, you know, as I say, when you do the apprenticeship and you, you have to learn these things, there's just so many bloody rules. And uh, I've always thought with fighting, there's one rule and that's win, you know. Right. And uh, so I, 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 was I tried to come up with something that, that had either no rules or one, one rule. There is one rule. The one rule is your head and your torso must be defended. That's mm. the only rule. Everything else, you know, limbs can be hit, but 
that your your head and your torso could cost you your life. So those are the only things that need to be defended. And other than that, it was about being able to move in any direction and about knowing where uh, knowing where that move is going to come from. So it's a bit like tennis. I base it on a lot of things, but you know. You, you see people play tennis badly. They run along the court and hit the ball. Well, the, the good ones run, get there and hit the ball. They've worked out where it's going to come from, you know. Mm. And I tried to do it like that. I mean, obviously character-based, but that was the the rhyme of it, if you like. And the, the physicality of those sword fights, and just to focus on, you know, the Phantom Menace, which, you know, within the first... I don't know, five, 10 minutes of the film, the lightsabers are already out and, you know, they're already using them in this, you know, great escape out of that, you know, station and everything. Um, did, did you, how much time did you have with, you know, Liam, Ewan and Ray Park, which were the three major lightsaber wielders of the first one to really indoctrinate them into the physicality demands that you had for them um, versus where you knew that you would have to substitute them for, for stunt doubles, right? Because to this day, I'm not sure how much of that is them and how much of them is a, you know, is a stunt double. It, 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 none is stunt doubles. I don't right. think only in the wides. We had um, more time than you can eat. That's the good thing with Lucasfilm, that Lucasfilm. Sure. Um, they would give you everything and um, <coughs> time is what you need. So I probably six, eight to six weeks prior, we would have been rehearsing. Um, we had Ewan. So we had Ewan all, whenever we wanted him, which was great. He did it all. He, he was never doubled. The only time he was doubled was that back somersault. There's, <laughs> uh, there's a bit where the two of them, I think, no, Ray, Ray Park goes first and then the two boys follow. Mm. that Ray did it himself. So he went off an air ram, did a back somersault, and the other two were doubles. But all the fighting was Liam and Ewan and Ray. Ray was, at that point, um, he was a, just, a, not just, he was a gymnast. Mm. And he, he'd worked on Mortal Kombat. I was looking, the brief was, they said, um, we want someone who looks like a heroin addict. He mm. was always going to be a stunt guy. Because it was, there was one line in it. I think it was "Yes, Master." That was it. Right. And they were, they were, they had the idea of Tricky. You know, the singer Tricky. Um, I'm not familiar, but I'm definitely going to look that up. So check tricky. him out. Tricky, great, great singer. There's a band called Massive Attack, and Tricky is. Oh, Massive Attack! I've definitely okay, heard yeah. of. Yeah. Tricky sings with Massive Attack. There joined. Oh, okay. There. And he was going to play it. Uh, which would have been interesting. But, oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. But uh, that didn't happen. So they said, first of all, they said you, they wanted me to play it, but I had too much to do. And a friend of mine had used Ray on Mortal Kombat. And so we got him in to um, see how he was, and he was fantastic. And so I really wanted him to play that part because it would make my life a whole lot easier. And... Um, we developed this fight, which ended up as that three-way fight. Well, it ended up as the mall, um, when they come out of the electric gates, that part. Yeah, the grand and, finale. Yeah, exactly. And um, But we, had, we just had it, the Ewan mall part of it, and we, but we were trying to sell Ray. We weren't, the fight was good, but, you know, we were going to take it further. And we showed George that more to sh to sell Ray for the part than the fight. And he liked both of them. Well, Jet, his son, who was, I think, five at the time, loved it. Mm. And, that, and George was happy with that. George said, if Jet's happy, I'm happy. So, cool. so that was it. So we got Ray and the style kind of in one go. And the these, these fights um, between um, these Jedi and these like in the prequels, it's so incredible because it's it's like some neo level dialoguing going on between these these characters, you know. And there's and like it's not just like 
The only other film, you know, with all due respect that I've seen that can even come close to it, I would say is the, you know, the original Matrix film has very, very good, you know, fight oh, coordination. Fantastic. You know, yeah, with Wu Ping Yen. Fantastic. And, you know, and, and like, but it's it's really only that and the Star Wars prequels to me where the fighting is like a true conversation between characters. Like, no, how much? There's, there's, there's a better one. Oh, really? I've just seen the best fight I've ever seen. Is, oh, I can't uh, wait you, to hear this. You must have seen it. It's in the new um, Kingsman. Oh, the uh, the one with um, the one with Ray Fiennes, the one that just came out, um, yeah, like that. the prequel one. You know what? I I started watching it and I kind of fell off after the first 10, 15 minutes. I wasn't super into it. But you're saying that in that film, there's a fight scene that you consider to be top notch, huh? It's Rasputin fighting, right? The real Rasputin is fighting Ray Fiennes in it. It's uh, spectacular. This fight. Right. Right. It, it's funny because that it's the, it's the same thing. Whoever did that fight, um, I think they were Chinese. I don't know. Um, it they studied the character, you know, so they studied right. Rasputin and they got it down, and uh, and that's what that's what I do on. on yeah. So I, so tell me a little bit more about that because this is some new level of artistry that is so powerful yet so un developed right there's not a ton of people that take this that to that level of of seriousness like how how do you start to like plot these fights in the service of the story like that well it's it's very easy and i think it might be where they're going wrong now to just do flashy moves you know to think mm, oh, interesting okay, i'm doing star wars it's gotta look like this and and that's not the way to go with it. You know, you, you've you got to know those characters as well as the actors. But more importantly, you've got to know the actors who are playing those characters, you know, because how you read it is going to be very different to how they turn up and play it. Mm. And luckily, spending enough time with them in rehearsals prior and also knowing them, I've, I've known you and since he was young, you know how they're going to go with it, you know, so... You, and also how they move. You can't think of write a fight and then force it onto an actor or, you know, or force it into a character. Yeah, it has to be natural. And so if one of your characters has got one leg, you know, it's, it's still got to work. Right. Yeah. And so it's that. It's character driven, script driven. As you say, it's a bit like dialogue, but that's just because the length of them, they were so long. Right, they, right. You know that it, it needed a rhythm and and that needed to hold through and not not just that the the pace of it you when they're that long you have to look at the pace of the movie as it's building and try and build your fight at the same pace it's very interesting that you use the word rhythm and i can't help but notice that i see two guitars in the background is Can you see my, my guitars yeah yeah do, do you play guitar uh, I've got seven guitars. I can't play one of them. <laughs> it's funny. I, I actually suffer from the very same exact affliction. I got tons of guitars behind me, if you can see me in real life. And and I'm not very good at any of them, but but I absolutely love them. So do, do you take this kind of, you know, concept of rhythm and actually try to use that metric in the fight sequences? Oh, 100%. Do you know... I can hear when it's right. You know, sometimes it, it, when you're doing it, you get this, you know, this this beat that happens and you, you're like, that's it. And it, the moves might be wrong, but that pace. Right. Really what it's, and maybe that's what it is. Maybe, maybe I haven't thought about it. Maybe it is a beat, you know. And, well, first of all, now I feel like I'm a little bit illuminated to the point where, because learning any form of art is about learning its language, right? It's lexicon, it's yeah. it's it's theory, right? It's and, movie, yeah. and, and this idea that I've never even connected of the rhythm in the fight is so obvious, um, you know, like there's, you know, not to skip ahead, but, you know, obviously my favorite fight sequence of all time is Anakin versus Obi-Wan in the finale of, you know, Revenge of the Sith. I mean, this is like, 
to me, high level art that, you know, has never been touched again in terms of the emotional reaction that you get from a sword fight. You know, it's just like, like everybody's spilling their guts, you know, on screen, but the, even the music, like, like, like it go, oh, wow. I'm sorry. Cause I'm stumbling because now I'm just getting chills thinking about it. The fight and John Williams's music are in complete sync with each other. You know, um, do you know, I went, uh, George invited me to Abbey Road when they were recording it, the Jewel of the Fates. It was amazing to go in there wow. and see a full orchestra and they're playing it up on a massive screen in there. Right. So, so, so you're you're the you're the kind of um, the conductor, like in a way, because your action is driving the inspiration for the musical accompaniment. Right. Like like. Well, I don't know if it, you know, if if, the, if it had been my choice, Mark, I'd have gone for "Smack My Bitch Up" by the Prodigy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! That is absolutely awesome. Now, to skip ahead to the Clone Wars um, is, you know, um, oh, I'm sorry, to Attack of the Clones, um, you get introduced to a new uh, character in your sort of, you know, uh, a troop of of apprentices and that's Hayden Christensen. What what was your impression of Hayden when you first met him? The same as it is now. He I love that boy. He's extraordinary. You know, he's a, he's a complicated character and uh I saw him a few weeks ago and he's, you know I said to him you haven't changed since you were 18. Oh wow, that's so cool. Um yeah. not Fantastic. An athlete, you know, unbelievable balance, brave as a lion, fascinating, fantastic young man. And um, Hayden, uh, you know, you mentioned that you saw him two weeks ago. And my understanding, not so much from knowing credits, but by being able to look at a screen and see what I'm seeing is that you're not involved in this current uh, uh, project um, of the Obi-Wan? No, they don't. They don't like me anymore, Mark. Well, <laughs> well, they tried to copy you in the last episode, whether you know it or not, um, to, uh, without, without much success, they tried to create a, um, there's a scene, spoiler warning for the folks that haven't seen it yet, there's a flashback where Obi-Wan and, uh, and uh, Anakin are practicing and they're trying to uh, summon the the essence of the old lightsaber style that that you brought to the world and um it falls very very short you know <laughs> but but uh you know they're they're attempting to create a carbon copy of something i think without understanding these other elements that you're addressing which is you know actor uh limitations which is you know rhythm and uh, it's also um, getting on top of their actors. It's sometimes you're on these jobs and they're big actors, big characters. Nobody wants to fuck with them. Sure. You have to, you know, if they look stupid, you go and tell them and fix it. And uh, maybe that's also where they, you know, them too. I can't imagine I, I would <laughs> with somebody else. I can't imagine what a handful they would be, but yeah, you need to be on top of them. Yeah. Um, I'm such a Hayden Christensen fan, and um, you know, I, um, you know, he has a limited body of work, you know, because I believe, um, you know, after Star Wars, you know, maybe like you're saying that he's a complicated fellow, and and you know, maybe didn't want to be as in the public as Star Wars got him. So he has a limited body of work, but I think it's all good. Mm. Um, did did um, did were were you able to kind of um, like interact with them a little differently that you think now is the standard of how stunt coordinators can deal with actors? It sounds like there was more intimacy back in the old days. Well, <laughs> back in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's only like, you know, it's only like 20 years ago, right? It's not even that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know how other people do it, Mark, but I, you know, I, I think I'm in there to do a job. And if uh, if they're not doing it right, then you've got to get on it, you know, and make it right. Uh, no, I don't know. Right, right, right. Yeah. Fair enough. And look, I, mean, 
I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Um, you said that they don't like you anymore. Um, what What does that mean? If you can elaborate on that at all? No, I, I didn't. I was only joking. I have no idea. To be honest with you, I thought I would be there. Right? Be, yeah, because it, you are the like. If you're doing Anakin and Obi Wan or Vader and Obi Wan, they're dialogue their quote-unquote love language is the lightsaber fight and the lightsaber duel which is your contribution to the universe so it it, it is very strange that your name is not associated with it and i say that with the utmost respect thank you it's not uh, uh yeah i'd go there in a heartbeat I, I had a great time doing it but uh, you know don't get me wrong i'm not short of work <laughs> sure sure of course not i mean i see your credits uh, they're, they're absolutely incredible but yeah, I don't know why. I I got the feeling when when it the new ones came. What was it? The one that um. Uh, what was the one up the one after the prequels? The first. Um, well, the uh, the um, the Force Awake. It was the yeah, Force that. Awakens, the Last Jedi, and uh, yeah. the Rise of Skywalker. J.J. Abrams. I think that yeah. then it was a uh, it was all about they hated the prequels, and 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 that's just Star Wars. You know, my generation was the first lot. Then the prequels, we made those for five to 14 year olds. Sure, of course. They're now coming of age and love it, and they don't like the last one. But I right. think, I think it, Force Awakens was they were going back and they didn't want any of this dancey lightsaber stuff. And uh, that's, uh, and I think that's what happened. That just, you know, I just was out of the mix then. It, it, it's really interesting that you call it dancey lightsaber stuff because that's exactly what I love about it. You know, like the mm -hmm. fact that it, it, you know, that it is a, a, a choreographed ballet of lights and emotion, um, you know, and, and like, how, how do you get there? Do, did you, I mean, now I understand the guitars and like the rhythm uh, embedded into your soul, but how do you actually choreograph that? Do you write it down? Do you just, I do it. it. I do it. Do you know, I do it not here in my old house, but one move at a time, you know, so I read it and it might, whatever it might be, it might, he, he just used to write a vicious lightsaber battle ensues and some time. Right. Um, but you know, you've got wherever they stop talking here to or wherever they start talking again or somebody dies and you have to fill that bit in the middle. As I said, it's, Carrot, you've got all the information you need because you've read the script up to there, you know, and you know how those characters are, are going to feel in that situation. So it's it's no different from thinking, you know, he's going to go bang, you know, and throw a, the first punch, and then you're in, you know. Would would that character avoid that punch? And if he did, where would he be moving to afterwards? You know, what's his most economical? It's all about economics as well. That you mm. know, why would I lift my lightsaber right over to hit here when I can just do it with my wrists? You know, or it's that economics. It's your feet. Uh, people always think it's about the sword or your arms. It's your feet first. Interesting. So you, as I said, with the t like when you're playing tennis, you've you've got to get there and get yourself set and get in balance. Um, yeah, it's all of those things, but it's all, it's all just character. It, I, I don't find it difficult. And, and do you, um, have a process of, of, of scripting it, uh, via paper, via, yeah. so, yeah, so, so we, yeah, we wrote it into a language. Right, right. That's the fascinating part is it's a language almost like annotation in music, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, it is actually. Yeah. And, um, we wrote it that way, or I wrote it that way, so that um, we could send it to the boys and they could just read it and do it on their own, you know. Wow. So wow. You, and, and if you think about it, all you need is your part. It's, it's your lines. You, you, you're reading the other lines too, but once you learn that dance, I could teach you it remotely and someone else it remotely, and then you come together and it would work. Jesus. Now, now that's all I can think about. Now I'm like, okay, after I've I finished this, how do I learn that? You know, how do I learn that language? Because, uh, you know, it, it, it really is a, a, a fascinating thing to try and replicate, right? Because like, 
that's the beautiful thing about language. You, you hear a sentence you like or a word you like, you want to try to use that in your own communication, right? And with with um, with Star Wars lightsaber duels specific to the prequel aesthetic, it's something that has haunted the world of Star Wars ever since. You know, I myself currently, uh, you know, like I have a VR studio, I make VR games, and there's never been a multiplayer VR sword fighting game for good reason. It's not an easy thing to do because people will just want to shake the sword around and try to like spam hit without any kind of, you know, uh, dance to it. So I've been trying to figure out how do you create a paradigm so that there is a, 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 a true art form to the sword fighting element in a video game. Um, you know, just by me throwing that out there, is there anything that kind of comes to mind, you know, ideas around that? I mean, uh, and it did make me think, Mark, but I, you got me on the spot there. I'll have to have a think about it, but there's no sure, reason, sure. Yeah, there's no reason why that couldn't be done because it is an algorithm, isn't it? It's, there's no reason. Yeah, yeah. Do, do, do you have an Oculus Quest headset? I, do, I, I, I got this laptop. That's, That's it. I, I, I don't even got social media. I, I, <laughs> you I have the guitar, the laptop, and that's it. That's yeah, all you I need, Nick. You can see my television, but it's on a chair and plugged into an area. I haven't even got satellite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, look, um, you know, we can chat a little bit after we finish, but I, I'd love to send you a headset um, so that you can experience what I'm working on because I do believe that for the future generations, we will – create more elaborate simulations and and having these kind of deeper understandings of these art forms i think it's you know it's important you know and like to me i'm sorry go ahead go ahead you were going to say something i know i was just wondering there because are you in the metaverse now yes yes so i i um run one of the bigger metaverse companies um out there um and uh you know our focus is purely around vr um, so virtual reality there. experiences. And you, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Could you do it in there, Mark? I mean, could I appear in there and be able to move with a sword? Yes, yes. And because my greatest obsession in life is what you created um, with Star Wars and that language of the sword fight, because it really does hit what George wanted to say in the original trilogy, which is a more elegant time. You know, like there was this, combat that was based on this kind of code of elegance you know and like the original trilogy didn't really have that because as far as we knew back then it was only darth vader was the only jedi uh, left right and um you know luke skywalker was had the force but he had no training so he didn't really know how to do it so it makes sense that they're clumsy sword fights because that art form was forgotten and in the prequels, that art form is shown to its fullest extent. And, you know, you brought that to life. And that's what I'm obsessed with is that kind of mythical art form that, that was created by you and George in the prequels and the boys, as, as you say. And in my game, I'm trying to recreate a simulation of that so that the user can experience that versus another player. So it's a very difficult task. But I feel like I've actually made quite the progress on it, and I would love nothing more than to be able to show it to you. Um, I'd love, yeah, I'd love to see it. It sounds fascinating. And if you could get a person in there, absolutely you could do it because you could then teach the other person. And Right. So it's like how do you create game systems where you have a feedback loop where you know is this working or not working so that you can adapt your your rhythm just to use your your rhythm analogy to to be in tempo you know to be in the right tempo yeah and one mechanic that i'm doing is that when the swords uh, clash with each other they get stuck to each other and they get stuck to each other for a certain amount of time that you can see uh there's a timer associated with a light with like like when they hit each other when that light disappears you know that you can separate the swords again and try a different move and this has helped uh, in the creation of a more elegant fighting system, you know, like, you know, to use a Star Wars line, but it's not 100% there yet. So anyway, this is just something that as a fellow student of your work from afar, because this is the first time I get a chance to actually chat with you, 
is how I'm interpreting your work. And I'm interpreting it in a way that's never been done before, right? And inside a virtual world um, with multiple people. There are many lightsaber games uh, that happen on a flat screen. Like there's a great one called the Jedi Knight Academy, which came out uh, shortly after the prequels did, which is a very good uh, uh, laser fighting game. Probably the best uh, lightsaber game still to this day. Um, but there's never been a multiplayer um, lightsaber game in VR. And that's, you know, not that I'm trying to do a lightsaber game. I'm, doing, I'm trying to do a sword fighting game, yeah. you know, that has lights. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so to get back on track here, because um, this is truly fascinating for me. Um, there's one scene in Attack of the Clones um, where... Um, you know, actually, you know, before I go there, there's a line in Attack of the Clones where Obi-Wan tells um, Anakin, you know, this weapon is your life, you know, and um, I'm not sure if you remember that line, but is that a is that a line that was in the script always or was this kind of as a result of the sword fighting being so effective throughout the filmmaking process? Uh, no, it would have been there already. Right, because you never touch the script. You like the script is like a holy document. Like everybody has to follow that document. Uh, yeah, yeah. And when and yeah. if it gets rewritten, that page comes out and the new one goes in, and that uh, old one never existed. <laughs> right, right. And, and uh, so obviously, like, I, I want to ask about the finale of Attack of the Clones because this is the first time that we ever see that many lightsabers come out oh yeah um, was was there any kind of specific challenges around sort of choreographing that scene uh it's it, I, we did it second unit ben burt oh wow uh, you know ben burt the sound guy wow ben burt directed that scene he directed it um ben loves chinese movies you know he loves ultra violent chinese movies but i hope we were going to do it as one massive piece and that's what we were set up for we had like i think we had a hundred or two hundred sword fighters by that stage right and you were and, one of them right uh, a, a, a syndrilic uh... uh well in the in just in that one scene but the arena scene that big battle scene they right. were ben wanted to do it all individual so they were actually shot individually which was tough for them it would have been it would have, i think it would have looked a whole lot better if we'd have just let them fight mm. instead we were on a massive stage and they had to walk out one at a time like that and do these their little dance of what they'd been taught and walk off and that was a lot of pressure for them you know to walk out in front of a hundred people of their peers and do sure. it and some of them never pulled it off and we never got to use them. Right. Um, so it was that I, I never liked that sequence for that reason. Sure. Um, one sequence that I have to talk about because it's just like one thing that I always loved about George's films is that they're not just movies. Every time you watch a George Lucas film, there is a progression or an advancement or an evolution in the entire medium. So he has a responsibility to the technical side of things just as much as 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 he does to the storytelling side of things, right? He's he's introducing you to new concepts that you've never seen before. And one of them that I think jumps out at me more than anything in Attack of the Clones is in the finale um, where, A, you have the first time in, in a Star Wars movie where a character is using two uh, swords, right? Because in the in, in Phantom you had the double bladed, but in Attack of the Clones you have Anakin with two swords in his hand, which was incredibly awesome. But beyond that, you have now a CGI character wielding a lightsaber like a true badass. How in the world did you manage to create the chore the 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 choreo? Uh, God, I always mess this word up. The uh, the choreo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the choreography, sorry. My Cuban side sometimes comes into play and I can't say words correctly. But how did you get the choreography for Yoda even, like, conceived of? Uh, well, I'm going to uh, disappoint you now. Oh, okay. But uh, it, well, he, it, well, he, 
I've said it before, but he wasn't he wasn't in it, right? Uh, he wasn't in it up until the morning that we did it. Inter oh, Yoda wasn't even in the script. He wasn't in that fight at all. And um, on that morning, George said, "I want Yoda to be in there, and Yoda to fight Dooku." So we did. We had no time at all to do it. Um, luckily, Rob Coleman and John Noel ILM were there and so they said look just if you do dooku we'll tell you where yoda is where we reckon he's gonna be <laughs> right <laughs> and uh, you know and if you can choreograph something that covers those options oh wow so you that, were so that's pretty much what we did so they um I, I was looking at it. The guy that the double, it was we had a double for Dooku, it's Kyle Rowling, who's a fabulous swordsman. And I know that each tape was different, but you know, you know they're only gonna use one. <laughs> so right. we let him run with it. And uh yeah, so he just he did his routines and he moved around the stage to where Yoda was going to be. We knew all the eye lines and, and Industrial Light and Magic did the rest really. But did you, did you like, okay, first of all, what, a, what incredible pressure. Hey, you know, good morning, lads. Like, oh, by the way, Dooku fights Yoda here. Like, we've just made that decision. And now you have to choreograph this entire scene. Did you immediately know that Yoda's lightsaber language would be as elaborate as it turned out to be? And we're kind of trying to block for that? Yeah, well, because he he taught everybody, including me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's the line, if you like. So, um, yeah, so he, all, all of the moves are in there. There's a. I know there's a lot on the internet. I don't get too involved in the internet, but about what numbers Jedi are. You know, are they a seven? Are they an eight? Are they a nine? Mm. And, like, like in terms of power, you mean, in terms yeah. of skill, yeah. Yoda is a nine. And so all of the moves have to be in there. And the most difficult move there is, you remember going back to, I told you, we write them. Yes. The language. And there's a move called uh, WT, WT, uh, w, WTV UB8 or something. It's a really complicated move. And oh, wow. It's it's actually if you're getting hit on the back, it's a you're turning your lightsaber up your back, bent over as it hits and, and rolling out. Oh my lord, and that's WTV. Yeah, that's incredible. I know it's <laughs> vertical third V three U B W T. Vertical third up back with twist. <laughs> is oh wow, it, is what it stands for, and Yoda does that move in there. That's that's incredible, Nick. I am. Um, I, I feel slightly robbed, to be honest with you, because it seems like there's this kind of, you know, to use another uh, sort of Lucas analogy, there's this lost arc, you know, with the uh, sort of Ten Commandments, if you were, of you know, lightsaber fighting, kind of lost in these documents that were never used to kind of be built on, because even, yeah. you know, even in the in the sequel films, which I personally don't love. I, like, I don't think they're very good, but you know, like ultimately like, you know, it is what it is. Um, the lightsaber thing is not an evolution of the artistry that came before it. You know, it's not adding, um, you know, words to the vocabulary. And even in this Obi-Wan uh, series, it's like, there's some better lightsaber fights because they're trying to be a little bit more like your style, but, they're still falling short because they're not like appreciative, I think, of everything that goes into it. You know, um, is there is there any way that we can preserve this or any way that we can uh, uh, teach this? Or is this kind of a lost thing that's lost to time? Uh, I don't I don't know, Mark. It's, um, you know, it's such a unique Mo series of movies, Star Wars. I, I yes. just, for me, as a stunt coordinator, you know, it's. I don't mean how it sounds, but it's no different from being a plumber. You know, I, I. Just, <laughs> right, uh, right. I, 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 
people's pipes. Right, and, right. Um, some pipes are more complicated than others, you know. Sure, sure. Um, I'd love to get it going again, but um, I'm doing horses at the moment. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, right, 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 right. So, 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 just to jump ahead, because like I want to be respectful of your time. You've been so gracious with me. Um, the the fight between Anakin and Count Dooku in Revenge of the Sith is one of the most incredible, beautiful moments in cinema for me because it's really um, has this moment of, especially when the two swords are kind of locked with each other, the red and the blue, and you have, you know, Palpatine behind them, the do it, and like all that beautiful stuff. Was that, first of all, I have to ask, what, were those two crossed over swords in the different color part of the script? Um, uh, no, not like that. No, you find, right. you find you, when you do it, you're looking, it's a strange thing. Cause normally when you do a fight, you are, as you're right, you're using doubles mm. and, uh, just usually because of time, um, and because they look better. But so when you normally, when you're writing a fight, you're looking for close ups. you know, so you're looking, you, you know what the fight is, but you're also thinking I can pop the actors in there and pop them in there. And they've only got to do doon, 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 you know, and you're in on a close up. And so you look for those, you know, you look for it. It's, it, it's interesting you should say it because there's another version of that fight. Oh boy. Okay. Now this is the good stuff. This is the good stuff. It is. Uh, I found it the other day on here. I was looking for something. And um, it was the first one we did. I don't know why it's not that one because it's better. Mm. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, that's lovely. That I was pleased with that fight. But I found this other one. It's Hayden just in his normal clothes and, and one of my doubles. And they're doing this um, that fight. And it is gorgeous. Mm, There's wow. a bit where they cross and Hayden pushes his sword onto Dooku's eyebrow. Just on his eyebrow and go, burns, burns. Oh, wow, well, I just got chills. I just got chills all over. Oh, my <laughs> absolutely. And it was much more, I'll send it to you if if I can. It's much more of um, a private fight. And it, uh, and it's really character. I must have been thinking, at that time, I was all about glimpsing him into the dark side for us as the audience to think what the fuck what you know that's not jedi or and so that burn on him i wanted to do and just the way he looked as he as he did it right right because it's very reminiscent of the scar that he has on his yeah. face yeah yeah you know? and and his head cut off we did i don't know if we did the i can't remember because i haven't seen the film for so long is there a bit where he lets go of his sword and catches it underneath yes right. yes 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 yeah. so, oh, so, 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 so he 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 um he cuts off Dooku's arms. That's just... right, yeah, that's right. Because he, he has to let go of his sword because his own arm would get cut off, so he takes it there. Right, yeah. because Dooku cut off his arm, so he yeah. returns the favor, cuts yeah. off his arm, and then he has both swords. The first time you ever see Anakin with that a red lightsaber. Catches it, twists and bang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's so freaking yeah. cool. What thing I you I wish they'd done more. There was another one we tried to talk him into. I tried to talk him into. I wanted the one where, you know, the little ball that they practice with in the. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. I wanted one where he was doing that and he's going to, to and the thing kept, keeps hitting him, you know, hitting him in the shoulder. He's like, oh, and he goes, God, fuck, bang, you know, and smashes the thing to pieces. Oh, wow. Is this in the Attack of the Clones, like early on? or in there. I just said to Josh, oh, it'd be great. You know, we should do this. And he's like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, one thing that you mentioned that I want to dig into just a little bit is that you mentioned that this fight was supposed to be a very private fight. And I've never articulated it that way, but I've always felt that, that this fight was really about Count Dooku and Anakin having their kind of Face off for the right to con to be the apprentice of the emperor, and it uh, does. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. I don't think Anakin knows it at that point. Of course not. He doesn't know it. He doesn't know it yet. But because the emperor's thinking seven moves ahead, he he knows that it's exactly what that is. And you, as the audience, are starting to get that feeling 
which is why there's so much beautiful dramatic irony in that scene, which is something that's also missing from all these new Star Wars movies, to be honest with you. There's no subtext. There's no anything. It's like it, it's like reading the back of a cereal box, right? Like, you know, these are the ingredients and this is what you're going to get and, you know, whatever. And it's maybe if you... A different machine, though, Mark, that's making it. Now. Sure. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a truly a sad thing. But anyway, um, to kind of skip to the grand finale, how long did it take you to shoot that incredible final duel between Anakin and Obi Wan? Do you know, not that long, really. George doesn't like too many takes, so if you haven't got it in three takes, <laughs> you're going to be moving on. Um, I would say it took the whole thing. I mean, it went through six stages, so at least a week, maybe week, maybe into the second week a little bit, but not long. And, and how many hours a day do you spend shooting something like that? Uh, we do 10 hours, and nine over 10, hour off for lunch. <laughs> right, right, 10 hours of just intense, like, uh, like you know, like athleticism. And is there the... Is there injury, like, you know, like a strained uh, calf or like a pulled hamstring? Oh, yeah, or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, they not bad injuries, you know. Um, but, yes, at the end, that fight you were talking about, Dooku, um, Ewan and Hayden, God, yeah. all three of them were in a terrible <laughs> Hayden could barely walk. He was limping <laughs> up the stairs. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, the um, um, there's this thing online. I have seen this online. Um, there's a alternate take of the final battle, I believe. Oh, yeah, that thing. That was one of my rehearsal tapes. Yeah, and it's absolutely incredible. You did know, you like it? what did you think of Padme? Oh, God, it's it, it's did, it's but did you like that thing with Padme hitting the wall. Yeah, first of all, I it's way more violent, you know, way more emotional i thought like and there was there was a particular moment in that fight scene where anakin is like casually dodging uh swings without any effort you know and like at that point you're like wow this kid is at his peak you know this is like you know and th that level of subtlety didn't quite make it into the final fight do you know ugh. There's three moves right there, right at that point that I love. And it's that where he just sticks his sword out and Obi hits it and he lets the momentum take it over onto him. Boom, bang, like right. that. And right. then the one where he, Obi lunges at him. Ooh, where's my camera? There, like bang, and he goes under it. And there's another one where oh he goes under it with his and knocks it. Oh, I love that move. God, I love that too, man. And like I'll watch that video over and over again. And that to me is better new Star Wars than the new Star Wars, even though it was shot with like a little tiny camera and like the quality is absolutely terrible. But <laughs> it, but the but the content in the frame is absolutely magical. And and, and like you imagine, know, think uh, imagine with all the background in it. I know. It's not George's fault. He he doesn't. He hates shooting, so he wants it done quick. And, right. Uh, he does. He wouldn't see that part as a part that he needs to cut over cover. And that's he has every right. You know, we none of us would be there if it wasn't for him. Oh, of course, man. George Lucas is 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 my hero. Um, right. You know, you know, without a doubt. And and you know, the fact that he was able to empower you know men like yourself to to express your art. Yeah, in and his... let, let you do it. You know, uh, that much talent he's got and he'll still let you. That was the great thing with that version of when we did those movies was they they picked people, you know, from who who did their jobs a certain way and then they let them do it. You know, what, one one thing that, um, that has always bugged me is that the Academy um, Awards doesn't honor um, the yeah. the artistry of stone coordinating because you would have probably won six, seven Oscars by this point. I, do you know, I'm a member of the Academy and I'm not bothered by it. I, some people will hate me for saying this, but mm -hmm. I, I'd have no awards for anything if it if it was my, my choice. <laughs> right, 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 right. No awards, period, right? Yeah, you don't, you know, it's a trinket. You don't need a you know if you've done your job well or not 
Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and, and um, you know, just to kind of wrap up, because I want to be respectful of your time, you've been so incredibly gracious. You're still very active in the um, stunt coordinating choreograph world. Is it is it primarily now uh, focused on, you know, great stuff like your work on Black Mirror and television and is television more where you like to sort of play these days? I do, yeah. I, I, at the moment, I do, Mike, and I have done since um, Wanted, you know, the movie Wanted. Of course, of course, of course. I, I didn't have a good experience on that movie, and and I uh, and afterwards I thought I'm going back to television, mm. and that's where I've been ever since. And ironically, I went into it just at the right time because that's where the good scripts are now right and, right um and it's i like it because it's more much more hands-on you know i i still have to do all the risk assessments and you know <laughs> they won't pay for an assistant and i like that because you know i'm i'm much more involved with it and do you travel to the us a lot or do you try to keep all your work exclusively to the uk no, I I'm actually resident there. Oh, and, okay, cool. In the US. In the US. And um so but I'm working here a lot, so I, I have to be there every six months. I wish it was sooner, but yeah, so twice a year I'm I'm always there. Usually cool. at Hayden's. Oh, usually I, I'm sorry, at Hayden's you said? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's first of all, that's that that brings such joy to my heart <laughs> because you can see it on the screen. You can see it on the screen that there is a deeper relationship than you would expect between this man and his weapon. You know, it's like, yeah. and like one thing that I absolutely love is that you get the credit of sword master in the star Wars movies. And is this a credit that you invented for yourself or did George come up and say, Hey, you're the sword master. No, uh, it, it is a, apparently a, you know, a credit, an existing one. I only had stunt coordinator, uh, stunt coordinator on, in my contract, so it came after that. <laughs> right, that's you can have great. force master as well. But listen, you say that you see Hayden with a weapon. You want to see Hayden with a tennis racket? Oh, is that is that? Oh, really? He's good with the tennis racket. Oh, huh? He could have been a pro. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, I, uh, man, I've had such a great time uh, in this chat, Nick. I, I really, 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 really appreciate you. Um, is there anything that you want to shout out? Anything, you know, like anywhere I can send my audience to kind of support you? Uh, no, I don't, I don't have any presence online. I think it's a good thing because I would, I'd get in trouble straight away. Yeah, so well, your I, presence is, is inside our hearts and inside our minds, which is like a much more valuable place to be, Nick. Thank you. Um, and one day we should jam out, you know, next time you're in the U.S., perhaps you should jam out. But after we hang up here, I am going to um, uh, shoot you a, a note and uh, I'm going to get you a headset. Okay. I want you to experience yeah. Yeah. that. I'll, yeah. I'll have my assistant send you a headset and uh, you can take your first steps into a much larger world, like to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi. Maybe I'll get a, a Twitter account before you know it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, this is the great Nick Gillard. Check out his work. It's countless. Look him up online and every movie you can imagine from GoldenEye to Willow to Sleepy Hollow, which, by the way, I think Sleepy Hollow, um, I just saw it recently because of the whole kind of Johnny Depp, you know, trial thing. And I was like, oh, let me watch Sleepy Hollow. A, I think it's, it's Tim Burton's best. Um, and B, I had totally forgotten how good the swords work uh, the, the the sword work is of the actual, like, you know, monster in that movie. You Christopher know? Walken. Right. What Was it Christopher Walken actually doing those stunts? Yeah. Well, Christopher Walken was a dancer. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he loved it. I mean, he loved doing that. Oh, uh, because there's scenes where he's, like, twirling around the sword where I'm like, oh, holy crap. I've got some rehearsal footage of him, actually, in his crappy old clothes doing it and he's having the time of his life <laughs> yeah 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 like again another beautiful piece of work i can't wait to see more work from you nick um you look like you're in absolutely great shape and you can kick somebody's ass so you know like hopefully nobody but you know tries to mess with you, you like it looks like you got about two percent body fat on you do do you have a extensive workout routine that 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 you do 
Yeah, you can see it. Wait, here, I'll show you. This is all I do. Right? Oh, that's all you do is the pull-ups. All I do are these. If you can, if you do a hundred of these every day, you'll be fine. Wow, wow, that's quite the task. But you know what? Um, if you saw me in real life, you can see that I put on a lot of weight. So I, I need to start doing stuff like that. But well, Nick, I don't know if you do. You know what I'm seeing of you? Yes, of course. You're you're seeing this uh, this avatar. So this avatar is uh, is part of my virtual world. Um, I love him. I love your hat most of all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a bandana. If you can see, like, uh, nice. uh, it's like a bandana. But you know, yeah. Um, this will all make more sense, I think, the more we chat, uh, okay. because, you know, there is some interesting stuff happening out there. And like, you know, I'm a traditional kind of film school guy. But like, like George taught me, if you're not pushing things forward, you're not really doing anything interesting. Yeah, you know? you're not on the party. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, guys, thank you so much. This is Nick Gillard. I'm Mark Fernandez, and we will see you on the next one.